All right, hi everyone and welcome. It's been a long three days um, and the room's pretty packed. Um, so just try and get space wherever you can. But before I start, I just want to give a big shout out to welcome the officer trainees from the Susan Swaraj Institute of Foreign Service. We're thrilled that you're here today. You're the future of India. Um, and we wish in future GTSs you could spend more time here and interact. And I'm sure there's a lot we could learn from you. So welcome. Um, I'm going to get straight into it because we've got about 25, 30 minutes. I'm with two maverick diplomats um, who've converted their lives into many different avatars. <laughs> and I'm, so let, let me perhaps start with uh, Ambassador Shingler. You've just stepped out of a chaotic, very busy last one year with huge outcomes. Almost every discussion in any gathering such as this or otherwise is discussing some aspect of the outcome of the G20. If I could ask you two questions. For you, what was the most difficult task in the last 12 months? And second, what surprised you the most? Well, thank you, Rudro. And first of all, um, let's, let me say how you know, delighted I am to be here and to have so many good friends uh, in our audience, in particular our officer trainees of the Foreign Service. It's, it's great to have them here. Um, yes, I mean, G20 was uh, like bringing order into, as you said, you know, a chaotic scenario because uh, when we took over the presidency, uh, the world was in some level of ferment, it continues to have its complications. Uh, but we had our challenges outlined right from the beginning. And I think what was important for us was to uh, ensure that uh, we held a presidency that uh, was clearly post-COVID and in many senses uh, one that could surmount uh, the geopolitical challenges of the day. I think that was very important. And our greatest, I think, uh, uh, task as president was to ensure that those challenges did not come in the way of the more important and pressing global issues of the day which I think every um, country, especially from the developing world, uh, wanted, is basically to address issues such as rising inflation, indebtedness, uh, issues of supply and demand, uh, and uh, a range of uh, issues there that affected the daily lives of people across the world. Uh, and I think to that extent, uh, we, we succeeded. Uh, I would say the challenges were uh, not only geopolitical in nature, but also organizational. Uh, we did realize right in the beginning that uh, we really needed to take an event and convert it into a movement. And uh, you saw that the Prime Minister's vision, vision was to take the G20 to every part of India. Uh, for our country, it's always been, uh, you know, international events have always been remote uh, happenings in the capital city. And so, uh, for the first time, to take 220 G20 meetings into 60 cities of our country, I think was uh, a very, very... Uh, unique, but also a very daunting sort of task. And, and for me as chief coordinator, I think one of the uh, challenges was how do we take the G20, uh, maintain the standards of the G20 in uh, many of our cities that had little international exposure, and uh, they were, which also had uh, capacity constraints, honestly. And I think we worked on all of those systematically. Uh, I think we really, uh, there was a lot of effort on urban transformations, developing infrastructure in some of these cities, and most important, bringing confidence into cities across uh, our country, in the Northeast, uh, Srinagar, Jammu and Kashmir, Dakshadweep, Diu, places that uh, were not really uh, on the map when it came to international events. So that was challenging, but I think my own sense is that the uh, the hospitality, the welcome, the warmth, and the cultural diversity and heritage that was on display enabled us to really collectively work on the delegates that came to India. And that, in part, contributed. I mean, I know I'm talking about something which is a uh, little uh, different from what you'd normally hear, but that, in part, contributed to the final outcomes that actually emerged. Uh, that delegates that came into India for G20 meetings got such a reception, they were so enamored with their experience of India that they really wanted to work on creating a, a certain level of positivity. So by the time we reached the summit, you already had a groundswell level of support and needless to say, we worked very closely with all of our partners, uh, uh, especially the US, in ensuring that we transcended 
our differences and made, uh, um, you know, brought about an outcome that uh, the world could uh, agree with and one that actually had the ability to, uh, to bring solutions to global challenges. No, thank you, and I'll perhaps come back to some of those points, but let me switch to Ambassador Gassetti. You've asked me to be provocative, um, maybe in a bit. Um, you're a twice-elected mayor for a major American city. You've been here for now about eight months. What do you find is the, the kind of biggest challenge that you have in your job? Well, first of all, thank you for hosting us. Thank you, Carnegie. I know this has been an extraordinary week. Thank you, Ruja, for your leadership. And Harsh, it's always great to be on a stage. When you say two Mavericks, it's really one Maverick and a new kid in the diplomatic space. And to the trainees that are here, I think even in the eight months, though I've been in government service for much of my adult life, uh, and the lessons are similar, I would say the challenges of diplomacy are, are a little bit different. And they're only as strong as the relationships you build between countries, between diplomats. At the end of the day, forget titles between people. They are there to sustain you in the most difficult times when there's stress tests between countries, between people, between issue on issues. And they're there in the best times when you kind of can breathe and dream together. And they're there at the most critical junctures when as we had such marvelous leadership from India during G20. And I think in many ways, India rightfully so deserves the credit for landing something. But every country could have spoiled what we landed. And it took the US going to a group of countries that we are close to. And it took India going to countries they had close relations with. And acknowledging where you don't have strengths is part of strength itself. And I think the challenge is admitting that, learning to be humble, figuring when to follow, and not just to lead from the front. And I think the challenge in, in India, specifically of the US-India relationship, is that it's so broad and increasingly deeper that the speed with which our leaders, our people, um, even our bureaucracies are demanding results, it makes the capacity of the job, and this is a great problem to have, that difficult. Case in point, when Prime Minister Modi came to um, the state dinner in Washington, you know, somebody who was a vet of these said, if you get three to five good deliverables, that's a strong state dinner. The week before, we were plowing through 123 different deliverables. 123. And in fact, after it, it wasn't like everybody said, thank God that dinner is over. Now we can go back to the rest of the world. It has not let up. Indians remind us of stuff where we're going slow, and they're like, come on, you promised us the response to our paper that was the response to your paper. And Americans are telling Indians, what's happened to that approval? We need the extra position so we can do the things that you want. It's unprecedented. And in fact, this week when John Finer was here in our meeting with External Affairs Minister Jai Shankar, he said, think of that dinner, because we certainly do, not as a high point of US-India relations, but a new base. And I tend to agree with that. It doesn't mean we won't have challenging moments, we won't have stress tests. We're kind of, uh, if we make this romantic, I've said it's like our Facebook status for a long time between US and India was, it's complicated. <laughs> now, when you log on, it's like they're dating. And then we're trying to figure out, well, maybe we've maybe even moved in together. And we're like, well, your habits are a little different than mine. Like, why do you leave the towel on the floor? Why, you know, can you please shut the door when you, you know, go into the kitchen? Whatever it is, we're figuring that out. And we're also kind of figuring out, where does this go? There's, I'd say, a positive romantic ambiguity kind of about where this ultimately will lead. But I think in, in our hearts, it's not challenging to your question because there is strong desire on both parts that isn't just a calculation. I think it's both personal, and I'd come back to that point. Your biggest challenge and your biggest opportunity is how strong the relationships you have are for the best of times and the toughest of times. So if I can come to you, Ambassador Shingla, is best of times and most complicated of times. You went as ambassador to the United States in 2019. It's a complicated year. You had a very big visit soon after you got there. You were ambassador for about, for about a year. You came back as our top civil servant in the Ministry of External Affairs. In that time, a lot of the discussions that we had between the US and India, if I remember correctly, a lot of that was about US-India trade, Harley-Davidson, apples, uh, agriculture. Defense was always considered to be a bit of the silver lining in the relationship. So the idea was that you had a bit of buoyancy because of the strategic logic that had been built by many people sitting in this room, yourself and others, over the last 10 to 20 years, right? 
but we didn't really have a kind of a, a diplomatic spear, right? Today, you have a new framework. You've got this initiative on critical emerging technologies. We've just spent three days with a lot of discussions on what can we do in AI, what can we do in semiconductors. There's, you know, there's co-production happening on the defense side. Um, if I can ask, what do you attribute this change to? What's the key driver for you for this change? What's making it happen? Well, I mean, you know, the relationship is, is, is amazingly multifaceted, um, but it's also constantly evolving. And I think uh, Master Garcetti referred to that uh, fact uh, uh, in his earlier remarks. The fact is that you need to work on the relationship constantly. And, uh, and I think that has uh, been one of the attributes that we've constantly worked to find, uh, you know, the momentum or to, to keep the momentum going and to find new areas where uh, there is a convergence. Um, uh, technology was always there, but the uh, ICET has given it uh, that very vital, uh, you know, focus. Um, of course, when I was there, it was a different administration. and. Uh, and in many senses, it was one of the most uh, challenging periods, but at the same time, one of the most rewarding periods uh, in our relationship. And we, um, we really, uh, I think, had to work very hard to keep that at, at an even keel. in the U.S. Uh, polity at that time. And I think we succeeded. Uh, I mean, one of the high points of the relationship really was uh, the Howdy Modi event in Houston. And I'm very happy to see Anupam Ray, who's our ambassador to, uh, to the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva with us, because he was part of our team that made that happen. Uh, Howdy Modi was uh, not so much an organizational challenge. Of course, you had 50,000 uh, know, Indian Americans uh, at the stadium, you had the U.S. President and the Indian Prime Minister who addressed that gathering. I think it was, in many senses, historic, uh, one that uh, you uh, really rarely see, uh, that level of bonhomie and that level of, uh, I would say, support uh, for a relationship expressed by American and American citizens of Indian origin. Uh, but uh, I think what was really challenging was to ensure that uh, in that event, we had a bipartisan lineup. And it had nothing to do with us. It was more the polarizations of that polity. And uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, that working uh, in the United States also meant that you, uh, you understood the federal nature of that country as you understand the federal nature of our own country. So only, I think, uh, an Indian to some extent can understand what the United States is all about because there are, you know, 50 states in the U.S. and we are also a country that uh, has a very strong federal character. You needed to go out and meet people in their respective areas. And I'm very happy that one of the people I went and called on was Ambassador Garcetti in uh, his wonderful uh, town hall in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and I think we've been uh, great friends since. And it's, it's wonderful to have you here, Ambassador. But the fact of the matter is that we had to work on ensuring that the Prime Minister's event was one which is bipartisan. And I think we succeeded because we had uh, a very good lineup of both uh, Democrats and Republicans, and I think that stood us in good stead. The fact that we've transitioned, uh, you know, from President Obama uh, to President Trump uh, to President Biden, uh, the Prime Minister had, has had excellent relationships with each of these uh, presidents. But some of that was lost in the clutter because, you know, many of uh, uh, the political, uh, let's say, uh, representatives felt that... Uh, that uh, you know you were excessively close to what they they saw as a republican administration uh, but we are as close to uh, to a democratic administration and today if there's anything that uh, establishes the point i think we have succeeded in keeping that relationship at an even keel irrespective of uh, governments uh, and administrations uh, uh, in 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 office uh, that that's the important challenge and i think that we need to continue to maintain that level of political stability, and that is what enables us to achieve everything else on the ground, whether it's technology, whether it's the people-to-people -people connect, it's trade, investments. I think that relationship between uh, the President of the United States, the Prime Minister of India, an executive presidency, a very, very you know, powerful prime ministership in India, 
that momentum has to be maintained and you cannot allow that to be derailed. So this is the point I was trying to make. So if I can just pick up one question, Ambassador Grassetti. So there's of course the political equations. You're a fan of Galbraith. I'm a fan of Galbraith. That's why we call this Ambassador's Journal. Um, he served as an ambassador in a very tricky time in India, perhaps one of our worst times, 1962. Um, had to do many different things out of the box in order to basically stitch up a solution in many different ways. Taking the question, so one is you've got political equations, which are obviously critical in geopolitics, but then you've got hard geopolitics. We're at a stage at the moment where it seems to us that some of the logic in the India-US relationship is driven by China. Is some of it is driven by the need to perhaps re-globalize. The external affairs minister in broad terms on Monday talked about re-globalizing. To, to me, that means basically shifting units of economic production out of areas which are over-concentrated. If I could ask is, if you felt that India was in a place that could not absorb that de-risking, would that be a problem for the United States? It's a great question. I think it would be a missed opportunity, but I think my honest answer to my Indian friends is no. But that's not a reason why in any way we would withdraw from the work that we are doing or not push it as strongly as we can because I do think it's critical to the world. So what do I mean by that? If we're gonna be just frank with each other, the US economy, about 2% of our economy depends on interaction with India. Just 2%. We're seeing FDI not yet flowing in in the rates I know India wants or that we would want here from China. It's going to Vietnam, it's going to Mexico. And I think there's still some really good conversations my Indian friends are having about what does it take not to make one-off exceptions for companies, but to fundamentally restructure how we tax inputs so we can have more outputs when it comes to manufacturing. Because this is still the highest taxed input major economy in the world. And I get why, it's not a criticism. There's not enough taxpayers' base, so how do you raise revenues when you have a shortfall? It's usually, it's easier politically to do on outsiders, but it's harming your own internal capacity to really be the manufacturing powerhouse that I believe India should be, that we want it to be, and that it is starting to accelerate to become, but it will require, I think, some fundamentally deeper changes. When I think about the U.S.-India relationship, I think, and to the China point, a lot of people overstate that China is the reason we are together. I don't believe that at all. I think it's one of the most important pressing things we talk to and that we are aligned on. But too often I was frustrated in Washington talking to people who were saying, who would only say, oh, US India, China, or US India, human rights, and nothing in between. Legitimate things to talk in both, sometimes we're aligned, sometimes where we may have divergences or interpretations of divergence. But our relationship is 95% about fundamentally other things. China is about deterrence. It's about, I talk about the four Ps, which is kind of our, our mission on a mission here. Peace, prosperity, planet, and people. I think it summarizes the entire agenda that we're pursuing here and that in many ways US and India are pursuing. So peace is critical, but deterring war, respecting borders and sovereignty, making sure that we don't have people who steal intellectual property, that we're not overly dependent on any one place for a supply chain, that is a deterrent piece. And most of what we can do should not be because any third party brings us together. I believe the US-India relationship is not additive. I believe it's multiplicative. We demonstrated that at G20, when it was more than just one plus one equals two countries. I think one plus one actually produced 20 countries together with a historic and strongest, deepest statement ever put forward by a G20. This is, I wrote something down a second ago, it is not an alliance, but it is an ambition. And we are not seeking to create a pull between the two of us, but a potential of what I see. India loves what I call geometric diplomacy, triangles, quadrilaterals, because the multilateral space hasn't been so friendly always to India, even though it's led that sometimes. But when it got too big, India gets lost. And the bilateral comes with too many conditions. The US and India, I think are a force for good in the world together, not just for our countries. Recently we had doctors come from Fiji, the largest training ever for something called the Trilateral Development Program that we have together with Ministry of External Affairs and our USAID, chaining doctors and nurses in medicine in the most remote parts of Fiji, 
trained by Indians, partially funded by Americans here in Delhi. Imagine us taking that to another dozen countries. Imagine taking India's work on DPI with our technological prowess of putting things in the cloud and going to Pacific Island countries, African countries, uh, maybe Southeast Asian countries and saying you can have digital ID, health, you can do digital payments based on what India has led on and this partnership together. Look at the Quad, look at I2U2, which will come back and be important and strong, I believe. These are the not letting us into critical minerals when you say you want us to be part of critical mineral supply chains in the future. And in our opinion, the IRA is too nationalistic towards us. So can we find preferred geography, preferred relationship? Maybe it's not an alliance, maybe it's not a pull, but it certainly is deeper than what we had yesterday and even today. So if I could keep to the vibe of that answer, Ambassador said, Ambassador Shingla, if I could ask you, you know, the other day, uh, we've done a lot on US and India, whether it's here at GTS, the last year because of ISET, there's just been a lot of US India activity, space, AI, defense, and a range of areas. But there was a brilliant minister from Sierra Leone, and she came up to me yesterday and said, look, this is, this is great, and I'm really happy that the US and India have found a new compact in the last decade or two decades. Um, but what does that mean for me? And, and so I asked her, I said, what, is, what do you mean? I don't know if she's here, but, um, and she, so I asked her, so, and her thing was, look, the U.S. doesn't get us. It's difficult sometimes for the U.S. to get countries like us, right? But it's a big country. There's a lot of capacity. Um, India kind of gets us, but perhaps there's not as much capacity as we'd like. So, Ambassador Shingla, I was just wondering, thinking five years or ten years, if I pick up Ambassador Gassetti's point, do you think at some point we seriously need to think about what can U.S., India, or others actually do as a force for good? I mean, the examples are great of Fiji, of health, and I really hope DPI kind of, you know, we can do a lot more with DPI. But are we giving enough serious thought, I mean, in terms of what the two countries can actually do in large parts of the world where there is a need and a demand and an appetite? Well, uh, I, one thing I could share was that, uh, you know, um, when I was in uh, Washington, I was struck by the fact that uh, much of our conversations really uh, went beyond the bilateral. I mean, I come from a strongly bilateral uh, background, and going to DC was quite an experience because whether you spoke to state or you spoke to the White House, or you spoke to congressmen or you spoke to think tanks, uh, you know, the dialogue always transcended the bilateral into regional and uh, global uh, issues and cooperation. And, and I think uh, that was the basis of a very strong partnership. Uh, Master Garcetti spoke about the fact that, you know, we are collaborating on issues that, uh, that uh, you know, allow us to synergize our strengths, our respective strengths. I think there is a huge scope for us to look at a joint development partnership that would take uh, the issue of, uh, uh, you know, human-centric, a global human-centric partnership uh, forward. And some of that uh, was reflected in the G20 uh, uh, summit. Now, uh, if you look at uh, the fact that, uh, you know, there, is, uh, the, there are issues like global security where we see um, very much eye to eye on issues such as counterterrorism. You have uh, climate change, which is important for both our countries. We have a very regular dialogue on climate change, but also how do you take it, uh, you know, to the rest of the world? And of course, uh, global connectivity. For example, the Quad talks about global connectivity, the India Middle East Europe economic corridor is about uh, connectivity. And, uh, and I think there is a lot of convergence in that area. So how can we take our experience? Of course, it is, uh, we have our respective areas of experience and their differentiated experience, but they're nonetheless areas that we can work together on. Synergize, as you mentioned, capacity as, as uh, uh, also uh, merging with uh, you know, the understanding of the global south and take that uh, into Africa, for example, where uh, you know, we can make a difference uh, to the lives of people, uh, whether it's on DPI uh, or whether it is uh, on issues such as, simple issues such as uh, modern technology in bringing modern technology into farming, or, you know, increasing productivity of, uh, of crops in parts of uh, uh, semi-arid or arid areas of uh, Africa. 
so uh, there is a huge uh, opportunity there that we can really work on. And I think we are already doing that in many senses. We are doing that bilaterally. We are doing that in plurilateral uh, fora, such as uh, the, um, you know, the Quad and, uh, and other areas. And then, of course, the Indo-Pacific. I think one of the most brilliant schemes that was conceived when we had uh, the first uh, in-person uh, Quad Leaders Summit, and, and Master Gossetti and I spoke about it just before we entered the hall uh, in, in DC, this is September 2021, in the heights of COVID, was how can we take a US, uh, you know, a US vaccine, a vaccine produced with US technology, manufactured in India, uh, the Japanese providing, uh, you know, the, the transportation and the Australians providing the last mile support into the Indo-Pacific. And I think, uh, you know, one example of that was uh, providing vaccines uh, to countries like Cambodia and Thailand uh, in the Indo-Pacific. Of course, that came in when uh, I would say we were already on the, uh, you know, I said downward curve of COVID. But the fact is that the idea that uh, the four quad partners could use their respective strengths and take it to the Indo-Pacific on an issue that the rest of the world really was looking for support on was something that was quite extraordinary. Uh, so what can we do uh, together? I mean, using the US's strengths uh, and resources and capacities, using our own, I would say, uh, efforts to, uh, to uh, an experience on human-centric development, uh, understanding uh, the global south and also being able to take uh, you know, make sure that our uh, buck goes a longer way, uh, making sure that, uh, that we have uh, the economies of scale that we are uh, uh, quite used to in our own uh, development assistance programs. How can we synergize those and take it, not just with the United States, but with like-minded partners and make that vital difference. Look at connectivity, for example. You know, we, uh, we, um, connectivity has been a major issue globally. Uh, there has been uh, different efforts at promoting connectivity, but we need a paradigm that provides connectivity that is transparent, uh, that does not uh, indebt nations, uh, that respects the territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, that has those elements that countries look to. Uh, and I think that's, that's a win-win situation. So there's a, there's a range of areas there, and I think we can do very well together. Okay, I just want to take the, I've got a little bit of time left. I want to take the structure and the US-India part out of it and just end with a question on each of you. India is a very different ocean to LA. Um, how is it going for you? What do you enjoy the most about this job? You know, the things that are similar between LA and India is, you know, LA and India are both sandwiches that the more bites you take, the bigger it gets. It's like a paradox. You're never gonna know the complexity. In fact, the more you know, the more you know you don't know. So you have to be willing to not conquer knowledge of a place like India. LA, obviously much smaller in population, but similar level of diversity. It's almost unknowable, and yet you have to narrate within it. I, I love when I can pop my bubble. You know, when you're an ambassador, uh, I think Harsh can confirm this, you, you move in a bubble. So to talk to real people, you have to like pop that bubble. And I've tried to use culture and food and cricket and you know, going to the Northeast recently and, you know, been in 18, 17 states in eight months um, and Union territories. So I love that part of India. I've always loved it since I came here when I was 14 years old for the first time. Um, I also love that it's a weakness of America, but I love how Indians and India know America and Americans so much better than vice versa. So my job isn't just to bring America here, but to bring India back to America. There's a great awakening happening in America. It's happening in business. It's happening in government, um, where everybody's like, I got to understand India. And so to me, that professionally is so exciting. Because you know, our, our Secretary of Treasury, this was the number one country she went to outside the United States four times this year. Secretary of State just came here for the third time. Secretary of Defense for the second time. FBI director is here next week. You know, you, you name it every week. It's an exhausting job, but we have so many people coming through. And we have a president who I know is the very first president ever to say that this is the most consequential relationship in the world. No US president has ever said that. And you're, you're right, Harsh, that this has gone through Democratic and Republican presidents. And, the mood always goes forward, some of the work goes forward, but sometimes the work actually does move backwards. There's conflicts on energy, there's conflicts on trade. Well, Joe Biden's been president, this is not a political speech, I don't do politics while I'm an ambassador, everything's going up. 
in terms of the collaboration, the actual work. And it is, it's still wider than it is deep, but it's deeper than it's ever been. And it is a new base. I do agree with Minister Jai Shanker. It's a new base, not a high point. In fact, if you look at the mountain of this relationship, where if you look down, you realize how far we've come. You can always look up and see a peak ahead. But it's just, my wife says stop saying this because it sounds like it's not a hard job to do, but it is the most fun job I've ever had because India is fun. If you don't just get Washington and Delhi as this relationship, but you see the rest of America interacting with the rest of, of India. And the last thing I'll say is remember, it's easy to caricature both of our countries. It's easy to think of America as this powerful, like Senegal saying, like they don't get us. The thing that's a little different about America than other wealthy and powerful countries is we actually are you. You know that as Indians, right? 1.4% uh, of our population now is you know, descended from or immigrants uh, that are Indian. 6% of our tax base, by the way. 10% of our Fortune 500 company now, CEOs, et cetera. But whether it's a refugee from Myanmar, whether it is folks coming from Mexico, we actually have connections to both the developed and developing world that are unique. So I think this human-centered development idea, I love that you said that, really needs to be that guiding principle for a moral US foreign policy. And the power of how we can translate you know, to each other, we're like the good housekeeping seal of approval for the developing and developed world. If we can say, hey, I can vouch for India, and India can say, I can vouch for the United States, this sorry, this multiplicative relationship becomes something that is exponential in its capacity, and that's a lot of fun. You know, thank you, that's, that's a wonderful answer. Ambassador Shingla, if I could end with you, he did 18 states in eight months, you did 21 states in nine months when you were in the United States. Um, there's a big, brilliant biography of Ambassador Shingla called Not an Accidental Rise. So if I could ask you, is, if that was Not an Accidental Rise 1.0, what does not an accidental rise, the life of Harshing La 2.0 look like? Well, uh, let me say that I'm really in danger of uh, being surpassed. Master Gassetti is about to overtake my record of, of states. And I think it's a great thing because, you know, as I said, we live in vibrant democracies, but we are also federal, federal nations. And uh, the best way to see India is to go out and see it. Uh, in, in, in uh, you know, its forms across the country, the diversity uh, and the absolute, uh, you know, variation that you come across. And I think it's the same for the United States in many senses. Unless you go out, you meet people, and you're actually meeting people where they live and where they actually uh, belong to, I think it makes that difference. I, I found that meeting a senator in Alaska was so much more productive than meeting him in, in the Capitol Hill. Um, you know, he's, he's happy to show you around, he's happy to give you his time, and that's what makes that vital difference. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, Eric, you've hit the ground running and you've gone and, uh, you know, seen India the way it should be. And, and I think that's the way that our relationship has to move forward, and uh, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, about uh, 2.0, uh, Rudro, I'm not uh, that sure. I mean, what is important is that uh, you know, you have the opportunity at every stage, and there, there comes a stage in your life where you have to really do a bit of a makeover, and, and that makeover is always challenging. It's, it's always easier to say that I can now, you know, take it easy, and we don't have to do, make that effort, but I think at every stage in life, you know, you start at a certain point, you want a certain career, you started a career, you want to take it to a certain direction, uh, you end a certain career, and you want to take it to some other way, uh, for us in the Foreign Service, and we've discussed it many times, uh, you know, it's, it's a really, uh, you know, cradle-to-grave sort of model where you're in that bubble. Uh, Eric mentioned the bubble. You're in the bubble, and, uh, and, and you're quite comfortable in that bubble. You know, you don't want to get out of the bubble. And I think the challenge is to get beyond that bubble, uh, you know, make uh, something out of, uh, out of uh, a reality that is beyond that bubble. And I think that's, that's what stimulates you. That's challenging. It's difficult, uh, but I think it's really worth that effort. And that's, that's my suggestion to many of our own uh, colleagues. Uh, you know, you must have the intrinsic ability to go out and make that difference. And it doesn't have to be only in the area that you're working on. It can be in many other areas. Ambassador Shingla, Ambassador Garcetti, bubble breakers, thank you very much for spending this evening with us. <laughs>